Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this evening will be Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 and 53, which say, The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. We'll be looking at this text under the title, The Miraculous Raising of the Saints from Death, as we continue our midweek sermon series entitled, The Miracles of Lent. So this is one of those passages of Scripture that can often lead to quite a bit of confusion and misunderstanding. It is something that's not really explained to us even in its context, and when we look at it, there are lots of different questions that start to come to our minds. I mean, just think about a few of those questions. Who exactly were these saints? How many of them were raised? Did they go back to their homes, or did they walk the streets? Did they appear once or many times? How long did they live after they were raised? Did they die again and experience death a second time? Just trying to wrap your head around some of these questions can be an extremely difficult thing. It's very hard for us to understand exactly what happened when these tombs were opened. It's very hard for us to understand how these people who had previously died were raised and appeared to many people in Jerusalem. And with this lack of understanding on our part, it can really lead to some confusion about what this miracle was really all about. It can lead to some confusion and some misunderstanding about the resurrection of Jesus and even our own resurrection on the last day when Jesus returns. So this past week I went on a quest to discover as much as I could about these saints who were raised from their tombs. I wanted to find out as much about them as I could so I could share with you the significance of this miracle and also give you a better understanding of what this is all about. And what I found, for the most part, was very interesting. There's been a lot of ink spilled over these two verses of Scripture. The only problem is that when you really start to dig into what all these people are saying, you begin to realize they don't know exactly how this happened either. That's kind of the thing with this miracle. It really is a miracle of God. There's no other way to explain it, and there's no guarantee that our understanding of it or our explanation of it is right unless we just call it a miracle and move on. It's only mentioned in Matthew's Gospel, and there's no further explanation of it at all. Now, some people have questioned whether or not this was really a resurrection, whether or not these saints really were raised from the dead, or if they were just visions that appeared to certain people. And that's a valid question. It's one that's important for us to look at and to answer. So diving into our text just a little bit deeper, we work our way back to the original language. And in verse 52, the saints are described as being raised. And the word that is used in the Greek is a gyro, and the definitions that are provided for it are to awaken or to raise up. So it does point us towards the idea of a resurrection. So now we test that word against a word that's used where we really know for sure that a real resurrection from the dead took place. We move to chapter 28 of Matthew where the resurrection of Jesus is reported. And we look in verse 6 where the angel tells Mary Magdalene that Jesus was risen from the dead. And sure enough, it is the same word that's used in that verse as well. So we can say that this really was a resurrection from the dead. These were saints who had died believing in the promise of the Messiah, and they were raised from the dead. They were resurrected, and they were allowed to go into Jerusalem and appear to people. And now that's something that is interesting that happened as well. These saints were raised from the dead. And looking at the context of this reading, we're able to understand that they were raised from the dead when Jesus died. However, we can also see that they didn't go into Jerusalem and appear to anyone until after Jesus was raised from the dead. So God raised these people from the dead. They were raised by the miraculous work of God as a testimony to the divinity of Jesus. But even though they were raised when Jesus died, they weren't allowed to appear to anyone until after Jesus was raised from the dead. Now finally, verse 53 tells us that they went into the holy city and they appeared to many. Now this, the, the holy city here is, is a very clear reference to Jerusalem, but it's a very unique way that Matthew is referring to Jerusalem here. It's not called the holy city all that often throughout Scripture, so this is something to take note of. And it helps us to draw a connection to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, which talks about the holy city, the new Jerusalem, descending from the heavens. 
So perhaps here Matthew is trying to help us to understand this connection between Jesus' work on the cross and our eventual home in perfection in the new holy city, the new Jerusalem. Like I said, there's much speculation that can be done based on these two verses. There are many questions that we can work to answer, and yet we will never be able to fully answer them because this was truly a miracle of God, and we're not always meant to understand God's work in this world. But one thing that we can take away from this for sure is the knowledge that we do have an all-powerful God. We have a God that created us out of nothing, and He has the power to raise us from the dead. Once our life here on this earth is complete, that's not the end for all who believe in God. As we read these two verses of Scripture, we're reminded of another two verses of Scripture. John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. This is where Jesus is comforting Martha as she was mourning the death of her brother Lazarus. Jesus says in those verses, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the promise that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. We have the promise of eternal life. We have the promise of a perfect existence in heaven with Jesus one day. We know that even though our earthly life will one day end, our eternal existence is assured and we will live forever. And that's what's foreshadowed through this resurrection at the time of the death of Jesus. It shows the power of God in this world. It shows that not even death itself can stop God from bringing His people to everlasting life with Him. My friends, this resurrection of these saints from their death points us directly to the sufficiency of the work of Jesus in our place on the cross. It tells us that when He died and then rose again, that was the promised beginning of our new lives with Him. We have nothing to fear because we will one day join these saints in the resurrection. Even when we look at these miracles of God and we know that there's no way that we can explain them, we can still take comfort from them. We can still know that God is at work and He's always working for us. And we know that we can still rely on the powerful work of Jesus for us for our forgiveness. My friends, as we journey ever closer to the cross, as we continue to walk through these amazing miracles that God performed during the final hours of Jesus' life, as we look on in awe and wonder, let's remember that God is using these miracles to draw us closer to Him and to keep us firm in our faith and in the promise of the resurrection. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all of our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. We receive your gifts.